Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're dealing today, we're, we're looking at dealing confidently with clients' grief. And we've got Meg Morehouse with us, and I'm Andrea Salmon. I'll be facilitating the webinar. We start all our programs by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians, past, present, and emerging on whose lands we meet today. And we acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and the relationship of Aboriginal people to country and we respect the cultural authority of the elders in each community. It's my pleasure to introduce Meg to you. Meg Morehouse works at Melbourne City Mission Palliative Care as the clinical lead of the bereavement team, where she works with families in the community, both before and after death, and she's been working there for five years now. Mm. Meg has also worked in disability, suicide support, road trauma and foster care. Meg is a social worker and an accredited loss and grief counsellor, and she loves to run groups. Her favourite group is called Serious Fun, where she works with bereaved children <laughs> and has the chance to get really messy. I do. <laughs> so um, thank you, Meg, for joining us today. That's just a disclaimer. We'll it. Just so that you can see Meg's really a real person, we'll pop the camera on for Mim <laughs> and she can say hello. hello. <laughs> We don't tend to use the cameras during the program because what we've found is they take up the bandwidth and they can muck up the audio and the transmission. So and you, over you to certainly me. do not need to see me for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get started and I welcome you all here today and um, I'm encouraged that this is a topic that uh, the MS Society and MS Connect um, uh, are interested in um, in hosting. I think um, by no means am I an expert in either grief or MS. I think that we've all had our experiences of, of grief and we all recognise different people's grief journeys through our different places in our fields. Um, please excuse my um, voice because I've had a bit of laryngitis, but I'm pleased that I have my voice back for you all today and I hope that I don't cough. <laughs> Um, so yes, I've, I've been working at, uh, in palliative care in people's homes in the community and that's, that's a wonderful position and we come across many different illnesses, not just those associated with ageing, but we have, um, I think palliative care attracts uh, referrals for people at all stages, particularly if it's an unexpected or a complex issue. Um, and so, uh, Learning a bit more about MS has been really helpful for me too. Um, now we need to move mm -hmm. it along. Yep, that was good now. Yeah. yeah. So today I'm just going to go through um, to bring you all up to date with how we look at grief these days. And a lot of these overheads I use directly with my clients and you're welcome to use them as well um, if you want to download and photocopy. Uh, part two, I'll look at the particular um, complexities of, of pre-death grief, of um, chronic illness grief and a particular view of MS. And then part three, I'll have a little look at um, improving our confidence and, and really giving you a lot of reassurance, I, I would suspect, in looking at strategies and resources. So when we uh, think about grief, often... Um, it takes a little bit of, of, um, of digging and of investigation to understand that someone is grieving. You know, we, we talk to people and they say, we're fine, but underneath it all, um, a lot of people are struggling. And I love this little uh, picture. I think it, 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 um, it shows that we put on a public face, but beneath that, it's, it's a struggle for many. It's important just to um, clarify that um, we have some definitions and, and a loss is about an event that has changed, that's perceived to be a negative and, and probably an ongoing change that's, that's hard to manage. And the grief is our varied response to that loss. Um, a bereavement specifically refers to uh, the death of somebody and that particularly acute response to that. Um, and mourning is about social or cultural reactions to that as well. But for all sorts of losses and the grief inherent in those, um, 
it's important that it would be abnormal to feel normal right now. This is not a normal space that people are reacting to. It's a change in normal. And grief comes from the Latin word um, that involves heavy and burdensome, which is a wonderful description. It's, it's weighty and sits hard on us. There's a myriad of symptoms of grief. Um, the evident ones about our emotional reactions are things that we can easily identify. You know, people think if I start crying, I won't ever stop and that heaviness and sadness, but also more difficult to manage emotional reactions like anger and guilt and regret and jealousy are all part of, of a normal grief reaction. There can be a lot of behavioural changes which we might not identify primarily as grief, but people who are um, not managing their, their reactions well, who might be um, labile and all over the place, who might be reactive and behaving out of character. Lots of physical symptoms I speak to my clients about, insomnia and stomach upsets and uh, changes to appetite, and all of those low immunity symptoms that we can relate to when you've had a major change in your life. There's a lot of cognitive or, or psychological changes. Um, I think the brain is profoundly affected by the stress that people undergo when they've gone through a major transition. Um, and I often talk to people about the fact they can't concentrate and their memory's impaired and they find that a real relief to realise that that's just a neurological thing with the high adrenaline and high cortisol and that just that can generally settle. The existential crisis that it can throw up, the, the, the questions of well, what's the purpose, why am I going to get out of bed or why would God let this happen or why me um, and life not feeling secure can throw up all sorts of those bigger questions for us. And there's a lot of challenges interpersonally. Um, you can feel very let down by people that you expected to be tuned in and helpful. Um, or you can be uplifted by strangers and people that you didn't expect. And the handling the, uh, the social reactions um, and other people's reactions to um, a big change or a loss can be really a struggle for people in the midst of it as well. So there's lots going on there in in, in just a normal experience of, of grief or loss. A really important thing to, to point out is that it's a very individual response and sometimes outside that setting you, you think they're not dealing with it as I expected. You know, you think of um, the Chamberlain's response or Rosie Batty's response, uh, you know, it's not a classic grieving response in our community and, and people get judged and feel um, very self-conscious and think I'm taking too long or I'm not grieving the right way. Um, or people might look like they're overreacting to something that's not relevant to them and yet it is because uh, there can be many factors that, that cause people or, or influence the way that you grieve. Um, past losses and your own support networks and um, it can be incredibly personal and individual and so reassuring people that there's not one right way. I often say you need to find your grieving style, you'll be doing it your way. Another important thing is it doesn't go from A to B to C to D um, and it's often uh, an experience that feels really clumsy and feels like slopping through mud and and is repetitive and you get thrown back to feeling like you're back at the beginning again um, and that can be hard and I love that uh, we sort of debunk the idea that there's a set way that people proceed through and a tick box system um, and likewise we rather prefer to talk about um, phases of grief. There are things that we do know. The way that people move through um, a very acute disbelief, hard to grasp the reality, um, a very difficult emotional phase. You could feel quite numb. Um, 
in the acute first few weeks of a major event happening and then it might move into a more intense period sometimes after death that's three to four months time when it's a deep sadness and a desperate yearning um, and a very hard to be motivated in that space hard to see your way ahead um, and ideally we hope that people um, manage to integrate the loss in their lives and learn to live with it at, at some point though um, it may be cause to have a look at people's everyday functioning and sometimes people might be diagnosed with complicated grief or we might be a bit concerned about their risks and that might be at a point when uh, they haven't found a new way to function yet and, and their everyday living's been impeded. So rather than the Kubler-Ross five stages, although that benefited us to explore the whole breadth of experience in grief, it's not it's not linear, but there are things that we do know. And this is a great little uh, card that's been produced, the five stages of grief, just various forms of crying really. Or maybe it's, it's a matter of feeling crazy some days and less crazy on other days. <laughs> this is a, a handout that we often give our clients to say, why don't you underline all these things that you're feeling? Um, what ones are permanent, uh, prominent for you at the moment? Or what ones aren't there for you? Um, there might be some new words that you don't understand. Sometimes people underline all of them. And then we say, no wonder you're exhausted. Look at all these things that are filling you up at the moment. And that's a nice, a nice tool to use for people to really normalise um, the enormity of what's going on. This is another um, theory, the dual process model, um, and it's also very helpful. I step people through this in their bereavement, and I talk about you sometimes feeling so deep and overwhelmed by the tsunami of grief, sitting there on the left-hand side, feeling the loss deeply and being completely absorbed and filled up, and then perhaps lifting out of that maybe feeling numb or maybe getting some distraction from it all or feeling normal for some time or maybe just getting your head out and wanting to fix or change and so oscillating between these two states is really common sometimes you can oscillate many times in a day after uh, a few months perhaps people might just know when they're triggered their grief is triggered and the tsunamis pour over them maybe on a sunday when they used to gather as a family or when um, you know, particular birthdays or when they hear a song. So this actually helps people talk about their different experiences. Often I do help people to have permission to sit with the loss and talk about just the depths of their sorrow. Um, people often talk about being so despairing they don't want to be here anymore. Um, and they need space for that to happen. And I know that outside of my sessions, often they're actually getting on and managing in their lives. It's just they need space to do both and to express both. Um, it's a relief for people to feel like it's normal to um, be, be flung about. And the other point is people have a natural tendency to sit in one space or the other. You know, one is more comfortable for some of us. I know where I sit <laughs> in my grief at times, um, but others, you know, they might identify, oh, Actually, I'll sit there. So not, there's no right or wrong about this. It's actually just a fit for you and your grieving style. This is a lovely theory that um, debunks the idea that grief has a time limit or that it's over or that you're even the same person you were than a year ago before it all happened. So on the left-hand side, we talk about an expectation that when the loss happens and it fills you up completely, eventually it might just be a little scar, just a small part of who you are and that you look practically the same. But the reality is that that, that loss is going to be a big gaping hole in the middle of you. You know, it's never going to change or disappear. It will feel quite raw for the rest of your life. It's just you learn how to buffer it, how to hold it, how to cope with it. And in fact, you change and grow over your time with your grief. And so your world expands up and your, your coping skills expand and the way that you mourn changes. Um, and so you're a very different shape than you were before the grief. 
And people like this, they, they tell me, that does my husband more honour than thinking he's just going to disappear and be a small part. He's always going to be a huge part in my life. So now we're entering your world and, and your work and, and working with people who have MS or chronic illness. And, um, and this is uh, a, a harder place to really grasp what the grief experience is like for people and how to make a difference to them in that experience. Um, a pre-death experience or an experience of non-finite loss that's hard to articulate is, is part of the MS journey. Um, and I like this little roller coaster fun park. Not a lot of fun in there, I wouldn't say, but there's, there's hopes and losses in, in, uh, in the journey of, of the condition, I guess. Um, and I've learned a lot about that, it, having some dealings over the last year with the MS Society. It's been really helpful. So let's have a look at what the actual changes are that might lead to a feeling of loss. Um, and, and acknowledging that people may not recognise that these changes and these reactions to the changes are grief. They probably wouldn't actually articulate it as I'm grieving. They'd be saying I'm adapting or I'm reacting um, or I miss this or I miss that or I'm angry about that. So the changes that are occurring are creating some losses and some difference in their lives which are hard to deal with. And you know, maybe it's easier to talk to our, our, our patients or our families about loss and change than grief itself, and that's okay. So I, I sort of brainstormed um, with the staff here about all the different changes that do occur, physical and, and your self-care, your mental health, where your thoughts are and how you think, your income, your career, um, your ability to be independent, and manage yourself. And coming down to some more intricate ones, freedom and intimacy, your friendships all change or your networks can change, how you view yourself, your self-esteem, or your interests, how you perceive yourself. And on another level as well, certainty and hope have changed. The world might feel very insecure for, for people who are facing and adapting to this sort of condition and all of its changes. Dignity, familiarity, how you feel in the world, the life you did have and the dreams of the future. So I'm sure you can relate when you've had conversations and witnessed people managing over the years with MS and other chronic illnesses. That all these changes that have come about um, can create reactions and our losses and then I just pose the question in that it's not just the patient that is dealing with these two. It's, it's probably the primary carer and perhaps the whole family and their networks around them can share some of these. So, you know, it's individual for each person in that system, but, but there can be many familiar things going on for each of them. I hope that that's ringing true with what you've witnessed in your workplaces. This is a lovely theory about um, holding that space um, in, in, in managing with chronic illness. And, and liminal is about being at both sides of a boundary or crossing a threshold and being in the middle of that space where the changes have no clear start or end. We're required to live in transition. It's a lovely theory. And this is a nice diagram that goes with that, that people might find it hard to articulate. If I got hopes or am I living in fear? What's known, what's not unknown? Um, am, I, am I adapting and accepting or am I fighting this? Um, there's gratitude alongside sadness and despair. So this kind of asking people to live in an uncomfortable space is, is a struggle, it's hard work. This condition too, I've learned, has a lot of um, complexities here and and we all would, rem would understand that it's about life not going in the direction everyone expects. 
So we, we have an idea of how life's going to go when if it doesn't go that way, we solve it, but not everything's solvable. And this can really, a diagnosis of MS has probably um, really challenged people. And it's very hard for people outside the situation to actually understand what's going on. People might look quite normal and be managing quite well and independent, but there are many losses happening and many challenges. Um, and the illness itself has an uncertain trajectory, which is a real struggle. So living, maybe living with that uncertainty and anticipating what might or might not happen is, is a hard thing to manage. And um, I know the MS Society do a great job at, at helping people find a balance and a new uh, stabilising within that. So again, that roller coaster of emotions that can happen all the time, relapses and a knowledge that this is going to accumulate and, and occur over time. And this was a great um, diagram to show the different points that you might have admissions or changes in symptoms or new, new uh, implications of an illness and you, you need to adjust to each, each one of those. That's a big roller coaster, isn't it? Lots of underlying anxiety, as it says, under all of that. And adapting to each stage. So just to kind of embed that, um, there's lots about MS as a condition where the grief is actually an anticipatory or a preparatory thing. Um, and people have different ways of managing. Some people go right to disaster mode and and process it and talk about it and others don't want to go anywhere near that um, and want to live in, in the moment. Um, but it can be hard to, to do both, you know, to gain information, to be informed and to be realistic, but also manage the anxiety that that brings and manage everyday life and keep hope alive. So it's a very uh, big struggle for people. And this is a great picture showing the build up of leaves on a big flight of stairs. So, you know, the grief can accumulate for some people. It can just feel like it's piling on top of each other and that we can't see an end and that it's a bit slippery and unpredictable. And as we were talking that it's hard to articulate to others or for others to see like the iceberg, um, there's a whole lot going underneath the surface that people really have no idea about. It's, it's you know, it's been a challenge for me to get my head around all of the complexities. So that, that word of disenfranchised, it's not recognised by the community. Um, that's, it's hard work. And the fact that it's ambivalent, there can be hope and joy and despair at the same time. Or you might actually think life's actually quite normal. It hasn't changed much at all, but but there's also knowledge and grief still there with a diagnosis. Um, and it, it's, it's ambiguous, it's hard to articulate, it's hard to put some language around it all. So tricky for people. And the whole family is affected, like a mobile. Um, we're all up and down at different stages, but we're all connected at the top. And often you can be thrown around by other people's reactions. Um, and likewise too, you can be buoyed up by people's support and, and other people's positivity, but the whole family system's affected here. And a particular word about the carers um, that, that are going through a very different journey. You know, they might feel like they're on a different path from, from their loved ones that they're supporting too. Um, and that's, that's hard. It's isolating for both and it can put a big strain on everyone's relationships um, and sometimes you're on the same page and sometimes you're not <laughs> and that constant change requires um, a mental adjustment all the time who am I to the person that I'm caring for and who am I still in this world and what do my relationships look like and and so they're kind of adjusting um, in response um, and with their own changes. 
And sometimes carers are the ones that feel they need to hold hope or um, hold it together or be the strong ones. And so they're witnessing change and witnessing distress or witnessing um, hard to manage things and having to adapt themselves, but also be an emotional support and and hope, help people emotionally cope and, and uh, sometimes be the strong positive face to all of that too. So that's quite a, quite a big ask I think for carers. And in the middle of all of that they have their own fears and maybe there's no space for that to be expressed. Maybe they're very, often people in families are protective of one another aren't they? They don't want to put a burden or an extra strain by saying how scared they are or that they're feeling um, very distressed by all these changes can be tricky and really for people who are um, dealing with anticipatory grief um, the ability to make sense of what's happening is the really strongest correlation to to managing grief well so providing people with a way to look at it with good information with reassurance with with strategies can be um, the most important way to help them feel like they can handle the grief and the changes that are coming up as well. And that's all um, part of your work, which is wonderful that you're here today as well, and being open to that important role you can make to people. Okay. Can I give an example? And it Love might be to. an opportunity people might throw in if, you, if you've got an example that you've observed of this type of grief for our clients with MS, that it'd be great to throw that in the comments and share it with the group. Um, I had a carer talking to me uh, at a carer's retreat about how hard they were working to ac not accommodate um, the, their partner's losses mm. and changes. They were trying to minimise the impact for that person in their life. Yeah. So the carer was working so hard to, what, what would the word be, mitigate those yes, changes yeah, yeah, yeah. and the losses Minimize. so that the person living with MS still felt that they had a role and a part to play. Mm. And it was adding so much to the partner. It, it was, yeah, it was very, it was burdensome. But I thought, yeah, I'd never considered that, that in, a, in that family relationship, everyone is trying to, enable the person to continue being the person that they were mm, and, and that's hard work. Yeah and often needing to make a lot of sacrifices themselves yeah. and losing who they are in all of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. yeah Everyone's true. life is profoundly changed isn't mm. it? Not that there's a right or wrong way it's mm. just hard work. Mm. Mm. And when you're the carer it's purposeful and directed and that feels good to be doing mm. and with love behind it, you will do all that you can. Um, and so the efforts can be massive. Mm. Mm. That's a lovely example, Andrea. Love to hear your reflection on what you've witnessed in families. Um, Kim's thrown in that timing is everything. Sometimes yeah. the person with MS has had more time to process the changes leaving the carer behind yes. and the carer needing to catch up. That's yeah. a great observation too. Yeah. I think sometimes the person with the diagnosis adapts somehow quicker than the carers because mm. they're living it and they mm. need to get on board mm. and cope. And they're seeped in it and they, they're they the focus of the support. Mm. <laughs> and sometimes it's clearer for them. And then so Angela's thrown in or sometimes vice versa. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That could be true, true too. Sometimes the person living with the changes is not, not as aware. Not, yeah. 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 You think of the burden that places on the carer to, to be holding all the information and trying to anticipate and mm. trying to um, think ahead all the time. Mm. Yeah. Both ways. It's pretty individual, isn't it, really? Absolutely. And, yeah. and that's that's a key thing to our response to people. Mm. Yeah. It's lovely to have your input. So moving on to actually talk about 
our work and and strategies. Um, I've, I'm starting this off by kind of setting some questions for you all to help you think, how am I with these families? What have I witnessed? So I'm posing some things for you to ponder in your settings. Do you often wait for a signal to initiate conversation about how people are actually emotionally coping or, or, or what they've witnessed in terms of uh, relating about the loss and the challenges and the hardships they face? Are you waiting for a hint or a message that that's okay? Um, it may not come naturally in your settings um, and it's a hard thing to raise. And maybe you wonder, is that actually part of my job? You know, have I got a right to ask this? Am I prying perhaps? Maybe it's not something you're comfortable with. Maybe you do avoid some topics and that's that's okay. It might take experience. It might take a certain type of person to be at ease with this as well. Um, and maybe you see some behaviours and you're now thinking, I wonder if that's just a grief reaction. You know, people's anger can get misguided or scapegoated. Um, people can be um, not taking in information or um, seeming to be a bit volatile or um, a bit defended. Maybe this is all part of the grief. Maybe this is, these are things that take some settling and some acknowledgement. Um, and you might wonder, you know, if I open open this uh, this bag up, <laughs> is that actually going to help us work together? You know, will will, uh, will that achieve anything? Um, and do I think about the other people in the room or in the in the setting too? Am I acknowledging that they might be in a different seat? Um, so all good questions to ponder, and and you come from very different settings, and maybe part of attending to people's emotional journeys or or attending to some of the uh, the impactful part of their diagnosis or their, their conditions is part of your job. Um, and maybe you have a more specific job. But it's it is hard work if we're going to um, I guess be holistic in our care of our families. Um, so welcome to hard work. I'm sure you do know this that it's very complex. We've already kind of unpicked a bit of that complexity. Um, it's not always straightforward. And people themselves don't um, often acknowledge that it's part of grief too. And you might feel that time is, is really precious and that's, that's hard. I acknowledge that too. Our nurses, um, you know, they're trying to see five families a day out in their homes and drive between places and they need to get a certain list of things done. Um, but it, it actually doesn't take much check-in time and that that makes a big difference to people's readiness to hear. When they feel acknowledged and heard, the adrenaline drops and it can just take a few words of kindness and care and a little bit of listening and things can shift pretty quickly and you can move on to the practical. This work actually makes us feel helpless. I sometimes think that's my job to sit next to people in in the unsolvable and to just tolerate um, feeling stuck for words and feeling some of their despair and not having solutions and acknowledging how hard this is, this situation for people. Um, and that's hard work. It's not something we're attracted to. And also once you build a relationship and you have trust and you feel like they've shared something really important, you might feel like you need to solve it all. Um, but often it's just the sharing and you have actually made a massive difference. Um, after all, we can't solve some of these big challenges with MS or with a chronic illness. We just need to be alongside people. Um, and it's not all your job, you can say, I'm sorry I can't help with that part, that must be really difficult. Or let's find out who else is around to help with that. And often we don't want to make things worse. So here they are, are all kind of prepared for a more formal meeting and you don't want tears, you don't want them to suffer, you don't want to bring up hard things. And we think that that would make it worse. Um, 
I think it actually um, paves the way for more honest communication and more productivity. And they're already upset, you can't make it worse. It's actually really hard for people where they are um, and a gentle, careful asking about people's um, emotions and management and coping is, is not going to make it worse. Um, we have our agendas and we have our preferences and familiarity with certain words. I know I get stuck in a pattern of of, um, of work with people and uh, and you've got to weigh up that the, sometimes the emotional support of people, the conversations don't go to plan. <laughs> they can go off track. That's hard. And this requires us to be really honest and open up our hearts and be vulnerable. Um, and feel with people and show that you're feeling and understanding and being human with them. And there are days when you don't feel robust and that's okay. Um, and there are times where you think, oh, that's a big ask or this is going into territory that makes me feel anxious or sad. Um, and you know, I think sometimes it's good to show you're human and um, what a wonderful gift you, you could be to others to just say that's moved me, what I've heard today. Yeah, so it's it's hard work, of course it is. So, you know, we do have um, things that can help us go there or ask the question or open up that conversation. Um, and I think you will do know that attending to the grief and allowing for some expression and some acknowledgement of what people are going through and hearing their stories is really needed. That's part of your service, your holistic service to people. And it really does make a difference. The feedback I've had from families, they remember those conversations where a specialist or a particular nurse took that time and, and really connected and uh, acknowledged their struggles. And I think that you wouldn't be going into this field unless you do have some capacity to um, look at things honestly, things that are hard and, and, and work with people who are struggling. So well done and remember your capacity to do that. Um, professionally, we have a toolkit of skills and resources. We've got, we're sitting in the, in the knowing position, in an expert position, and there are things that we can offer. And not every day is gonna require you to work that, in that aspect and that way. Um, every day is different for me, even though I'm a grief counsellor, I can have easier days and harder days. And often you can go back to your team who will understand what you're managing with. I hope that you've got some colleagues that you can speak to um, and that there is some acknowledgement that this is part of your role. Um, and boundaries and supervision and good professionalism and good self-care are all factors in that. Um, and just a bit of self-compassion to give yourself a break and say, this is tough. This is really, that was a hard day and give yourselves a pat on the back is important. Um, so I'm hoping that all of that is reassuring really to what you probably all do very sensitively and kindly in your everyday work. Um, there's a big role to, um, to help people and to help adjust, help them adjust to their situation, their changing symptoms and their changing condition. And, and it requires holding um, hope and adjusting that hope, but also being honest. And that's a tricky thing to hold um, for people. Um, so being honest with people in your communication is absolutely a necessity. They're not going to, um, feel secure with, with your care of them unless they're feeling like you're being honest and that is really hard and confronting. And when you are honest, um, you can make way for greater understanding and and for them to change how they see their future and what, what hope is for them and to help find a new balance and an acceptance with with the changes that they're, that they're facing. Um, and so empathy and repeated education and and just clarity and heartfelt honesty can all help that hope to be realistic. Um, and that's so important and it's valued by families. They know when you're being um, real with them. 
And so even then being able to move on to actually giving some really good advice about coping strategies and about plans and showing this action to take, that can help increase people's motivation and feel more positive about the future. And I hope that your roles all allow you to, I'm sure that's what your roles are about, um, making individualised plans and putting things in action and solving problems with people and that all can add to it. But it's got to start from a position of honesty and education. And so all these things for a family, relationships and belief and dignity and finding some peace with things and finding some meaning in life, having good symptom control and reassurance and even having a sense of humour amongst all of this, all of that can help increase a sense of hope for people in, in a really hard situation. Yeah. It's a lot of talking for me, isn't it? Meg, a, a question's raised for me in that. Mm. How do we recognise when it's okay to try to move people into that hope area. I was talking to a lady just last week who was very stuck in the grief of all the losses that she mm. had, mm. work and ability and it, it was all negative. Mm. And and I, I didn't know, you know, how I did challenge her around, let's look for something good each day. Mm. But, but there was part of me thinking, when how do you know when the time is mm. right to to, to challenge lift it that and challenge yeah. it yeah i think the first step is is some people require a lot more listening and sitting with the hard and not placating it mm. and and just normalizing it and being confident in in understanding all of that and demonstrating it's known and understood and that it's actually normal and often without being patronising or, or, or whitewashing a situation or saying everybody goes through it, but that I've heard that, I understand this. Yeah, I'm familiar with that, tell me more. And allowing people to, I guess, feel adequately heard. Mm -hmm. And then the space opens up when the adrenaline and the, and the intense feelings drop away, the space then opens up for people to absorb a bit more uh, positivity. Mm. And, and sometimes it only happens right at the end of a conversation with me when I'll say, um, what do you have gratitude for at the moment? And it might be very small things, or um, you know I wouldn't have my job if I didn't actually see people come to a better place of balance and more positivity can, you know, this does settle. Just really gentle hints that say there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And it, and that message of um, uh, coming from a place of experience, I've seen many people through this, and this is a really tough space, but you know, there are ways that we do help people adapt, and I'm alongside you for that. Mm. And just a few little words of you having a sense of control, a sense of this is the way it proceeds and people to manage, you know. I see a lot of strength in you, you know, picking up some strengths in people in their experience um, and acknowledging that even perhaps tapping into past experiences and their resilience through all of this can, um, I guess you're in a position of authority more than anyone else to say, um, we know our way through this and stick with me. And it might not be even more practical than that. Um, sometimes I give people little bits of homework to say, um, you know, your struggle is known. Um, uh, you have, you've shown me a lot of courage today um, and we'll get through this together. You know, little messages of support and positivity where I'm, I'm showing them I can hear strength and coping and I'm validating them. Mm. Yeah, it's it's hard and I think that you're left with hopeless, you know, helplessness if you're 
if you've taken on all that sadness and hardness and you think I haven't left them with anything, but what you're doing in that deep listening is actually shifting them. Mm. They'll leave feeling deeply heard and understood and connected. And it actually makes space for them to go out and cope again. You may not see that coping, that's the thing. You're seeing the heart side of it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a hard balance. Mm. So we're talking about that real deep listening and, and the leaning in and, and inviting and demonstrating an openness and a connectedness and a really trying to understand it from their point of view. And, and that's the support that really makes a difference when people feel um, they've been deeply understood. It's different from a normal listening, you know, they might have friends that listen, but especially if you're coming from a position of authority and knowledge and you're giving them a good validation and appreciation with a little bit of education on the side. There's some really lovely skills here that that are, I think, terrific for demonstrating a willingness to hear a bit more and to really deeply understand. And I talked about normalising, so it's not just everyone goes through that, that's not going to help at all, but goodness, oh, I'm familiar with this, other people have told me, that's extraordinary. And Oh, we, we do understand this is part of part of MS. Yeah, that's that's familiar to me. And it can be reassuring to feel like you're not going mad or you're not the only one. Yeah. Noticing and naming is just listening for those words and you can pick it up and reflect back and say, I've heard you use that term. What do you mean by that? Um, you know, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about um, that word that you've used. And actually just letting people sit with some of those feelings rather than changing the subject or placating. And that's really hard to sit with those hot spots and stay with the issue. And if you get a hint, poke around, you know. Oh, is that, gosh, what's happening there? I, I saw you, you know, struggle a bit with that news. Was that hard to hear? You know, little bits of gentle poking around where they can dismiss it if they like. It's just an invitation. And validation is lovely, even just using their words back to them. And sometimes I say, that's extraordinary. Can I write that sentence down and I'll repeat it back as I write it so that they're feeling really honoured and, and deeply understood. And lots of wondering, that's helpful. I'm wondering if this, I'm wondering if that, I don't always get it right. Am I on track here? You know, sharing that wondering, showing that you're inquisitive and you're not put off by things. Helpful little words, hey? Mm. Yeah. Um, I've picked out a few quotes from some reading that I've been doing that I thought was really helpful for for you all as we really think about how we make, make a difference in our different settings. And I think demonstrating that it's individualised care, that this is their journey and we want to understand it from their point of view. And so really being meticulous with, is this going to fish? Is this the right thing? Is that something you can manage with? Um, you know, understanding things that are, are quite particular to that family. And just sitting with clients through hardness can help them adapt. Having someone on the journey so not just listening and helping them learn and accept, but also move into a life that is worthwhile and livable and bearable. You know, it's that extra step and that's where your experience, your skills, your goal setting, your, your creativity can come in. Um, and, and that's the satisfaction, isn't it? So, you know, yes, we need to sit, listen, allow acceptance, allow an emotional shift for people, um, but also moving that into a worthwhile life. Finding out what's working and what isn't, you know, that might actually help discern uh, and set some hope and get some direction. Um, and also, you know, talking about the feelings associated with these challenges. 
giving them that opportunity to express their feelings where it's not being, I guess, band-aided over or placated. Sharing hopes and worries about what's meaning is, what all this means is very therapeutic. And this open discussion doesn't cause further harm. It doesn't set people back. In fact, it does improve quality of life and coping for everybody. So that's really important to remember. These are quotes from my carers. They said, I wish that the specialists or the professionals asked me what I needed to know. I realise that they're not going to tell you unless you make it clear you need good facts. And so um, they needed often to take the upper hand in conversations. And also it was important that they felt they were being read well. Um, so, you know, I wanted more information. Surely they could see that. I was well enough informed. I was, I was able to take on a bit more. I wish they'd give me a bit more information. And sometimes they needed to have things repeated a lot. So I didn't recognise what was going on. I was so busy. I was just responding to the next crisis. Um, and so realising that they're often in a heightened sense of crisis with that adrenaline going on when they're not taking in information, keeping up the education, checking in, um, being straight, of course, is important. So uh, a family said that the, uh, the clinician said when, when when someone was entering a terminal, terminal phase, this is not a recoverable situation. Of course, you know, we've been living with that. But what he really wanted to say is he's actually actually dying. Um, you know, and it might mean that the euphemisms where you want to be gentle with information actually isn't helping. They need, uh, need things to be straight. Um, so this is about not avoiding talking about death, but it might be actually don't avoid talking about the hard stuff either. So the information's hard to hear, but it is useful as well. And who else is going to tell you? Um, you know, it's 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 your the professionals out there face to face with the people who are assessing the situation that need to say it, and so don't avoid it. Um, Preventing changes from being a surprise, whether it's death or whether it's a change in symptoms or what's coming up ahead. So you've been told um, so many times you don't recognise that this time it's different. Um, people still feel like they get taken by surprise by changes. And they say it meant a lot, that real kindness when you're at your wit's end. So all my carers talk about specific specific conversations that made a huge difference to how they feel they were coping with some really difficult situations and it involved real kindness, which is reassuring, isn't it? We can all be kind. We're nearly at the end. Um, it's important to kind of feel like you, you're able to assess when there's trouble brewing or when people actually aren't coping or when you need to maybe make a call and refer out. And so if people aren't, um, if you're hearing that they're not actually managing their daily living tasks, if they're not managing to get out or be washed or have food, of course we need to bring some more support in. Um, people who are expressing that they're feeling unworthy um, or burdened, I'm a burden to everyone, I'm not worthy. Um, suicidal ideation, it's different from life's not worth living, uh, this is too hard, I don't want to be here to, I want to take my life. You know, that requires some questioning to notice the difference. And blaming themselves, um, feeling an, a, a large amount of guilt, isolating and disconnecting and withdrawing, all little red flags. Um, and our first job is to explore that and prod and ask a bit more and ask a bit more. And then making a plan and resourcing and finding a bit more support, of course, which is probably all part of what you do every day is that big picture analysis of what's happening for people. Um, just a short word as we finish up that we're all in a helping welfare giving situation that takes a lot of energy and that when we do talk to people about emotional concerns and when we respond empathically with the heart, it does take it out of you, takes its toll. 
and dealing with your own with patients' emotions and concerns, their feelings of failure and helplessness and frustration mean that you've got an added burden on your shoulders. You need to share that. You need to be aware and tuning in to that. And it needs good support and good self-care and good compassion. And I hope that you've all found ways in your own wonderful busy jobs to do that. And there's lots of great places to get extra support and knowledge um, for your families and for yourself. Um, so I've made a little list here, which I've known about. And this wonderful place at MS Australia is a great place to go to, of course. Um, there's a couple of grief websites um, at the bottom there that are really helpful. Um, and I've gathered a few of those websites and taken screenshots of them in, in your handouts. And there was also a couple of, um, there's a medical journal and uh, advanced care planning document that has some language in it that might be really helpful. It's good to have some words to refer to and check in about. And we're just finishing up and I want to thank you for your time and for sitting with some of this and exploring its relevance to your work and being open and hopefully sharing some of your responses. Um, and I'm very appreciative of all the care that you do to, that you give to your families in your everyday work. Um, and I wish you very well in all of that. And my details are there if you wanted resources or just a conversation, I'm very open to that as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Meg. I'm gonna just go. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for all of those ideas and thoughts and getting us to think about the work that we're doing and the important conversations to have. People might like to throw in some questions or comments to Meg um, as we just, I'll, I'll flick through a few little slides that will give you a chance to type in because we realise that it takes a bit of time to type in your questions. But just as our, as we finish up, we'll just prompt um, those of you online to be aware of all the range of services that MS has and that little wheel's a bit of a guide that's on our website. There are some resources for health practitioners on our website that are called MS Practice. They're a free online series and you can search for them. Um, the, there's an MS Australia web address at the bottom, but they're also on the ms.org.au website as well. And um, just again, a prompt that MS is a registered NDIS provider. So if you're working with people who are within the NDIS and you think we'd be a good fit for supporting them, let us know. As a participant in today's webinar too, you also have access to our eBooks that are online and all of this is in your handouts mm -hmm. as well. But there are some, uh, not a huge collection, but a collection of books specific to MS on our eBook library and there you've got the username and the password to get in to borrow those and other recordings of other programs that we've run for health professionals are available through the MS shop on the ms.org.au website and if you're not already receiving in form once a month you can subscribe to get that newsletter it's just a one pager uh, for health professionals and it will tell you what's coming up and also have some important research links. And then that's our little thank you as well. Thank you very much to Meg for coming in and thank you for everyone being online. Now, no one has thrown in any other questions in there, so I'll assume that- Exhausted you, you, and overwhelmed. No, I was gonna say that you covered it so well. There wasn't the that's need so to true. ask questions, but I'm guessing this is now someone's popped in a comment. Ruth said, thank you, oh, Meg, lovely presentation. Um, really appreciated the micro skills and the red flags. Mm. Super helpful in our time pressed world when increasingly it feels like our client work is very task focused, yes. particularly in the support coordination role that yes. can leave limited time for checking in with clients and carers. So Ruth found you, our, your presentation very useful. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, and I must admit that's the slide that I've chosen to print a, a whole copy of so that I've got that micro skills, micro -skills up yeah. beside me. Yeah. And the red flags, it is so important 
to not back away from the conversation when you notice some red flags. Insane or two, yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. Thank you all for your time today and thank you again, Meg. Oh, you're we'll quite finish welcome. Up for now. Thanks everyone.